All right, welcome everyone to the National Fellow Online Lecture Series. The topic we will discuss today is Salter Harris Fractures. My name is Dana. I'm a sports medicine physician at Dignity Health and your moderator for today. This lecture series is sponsored by the AMSSM Online Fellows Education Subcommittee, co-sponsored by the Education Committee and the Fellowship Committee. These lectures are meant to serve as an adjunct to your individual fellowship program education and provide direct access to learning from experienced AMSSM members and invited guest speakers in a variety of formats. This is also meant to assist in CAQ exam preparation. So make sure as a reminder to mute your microphone, turn off your video. You can submit questions at any time through the chat function. Feel free to include your name and your program if you wish. And at the end of the talk, I, as the moderator, will ask the questions in the Q&A based on the questions you submit. After the program, please evaluate um, the lecture with the link that we will send in the chat. And now I'd like to introduce you to our expert speaker today, Dr. Laura Goldberg. Dr. Laura Goldberg is a sports medicine specialist at University Hospitals of Cleveland and Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital. She is a team physician for multiple colleges, schools, and academies, providing event coverage for many events, including soccer tournaments, triathlons, wrestling tournaments, and sailing regattas. She's the lead physician of the University Hospital's running program. She was also the medical director for the Rite Aid Cleveland Marathon for almost a decade and continues to provide physician coverage for marathon and other road races. She herself has participated in multiple sports, including over 20 marathons, road and mountain biking, alpine ski racing, tennis, soccer, ultimate frisbee, and participated in the 1996 Olympic trials for women's single-handed sailing. With that, welcome, Dr. Goldberg. Thanks so much for being here, and I'll let you take it away. Thank you, Dana. So I, as Dana said, I'm a um, sports medicine physician. I did train in pediatrics, and I now am currently doing mostly pediatric sports medicine uh, at university hospitals. I previously did some all-ages sports medicine as well. So today, as we mentioned, it's the National Fellow Online Lecture Series and sponsored by um, AMSSM and the online subcommittee of the Fellows Education, Education Committee, and Fellowship Committee. So today, my objectives are to go over the epidemiology of Salter Harris fractures, to review bone anatomy and development, uh, to, of course, review the classification, which we all need to know, and then to go over some varial, various aspects of different crises. So the risk of a childhood fracture is very high. Um, 42 to 60% of boys will experience a fracture during life, during, during their childhood, and 27 to 40% of girls. The incident peaks with peak growth velocity. So when we are going through greater growth, we're more likely to have a risk of a physial fracture. The annual incidence of a fracture in childhood is 12 to 36 per thousand person years and 15 to 18%, and some studies show 30% of all pediatric fractures involve the physis. The distal radius is the most common location. So before we talk about the different fractures, I wanna talk a little bit about bone formation. So in the embryonic development, we have different types of formation. One is intramembranous ossification, and that's what happens with our skull and our clavicle. And that's when the, the bone develops within a membrane. What we're gonna talk mostly about today is endochondral ossification, which is when there's a cartilage scaffold that has organized chondrocytes in zones that are bound by a perichondrium that becomes periosteum. So basically it's got gradual replacement of hyaline cartilage with bony tissue. So this happens embryonically with our long bones. And then as we go on growing, it happens within our growth plates. It also happens within fracture healing. So when we talk about the long bone, there's three major parts that we need to think about. The diaphysis is the primary ossification center or the shaft, and that's what happens embryonically. It contains cortical bone, bone marrow, and adipose tissue. The epiphysis is sort of the bulbous or the larger part at the end, and it's a secondary ossification center. It ossifies separately and then later ankylosis to the main bone, and it has red bone marrow producing erythrocytes in it. The metaphysis is the neck portion, and it contains the growth plate as well as it transfers the load to the diaphysis. So physis means growth, and there's two types of growth plates. 
One is the pressure physis, which is perpendicular to the, long bone, um, to the long axis of the bone, and it provides longitudinal growth at the end of long bones. It's intraarticular and it bears weight. The traction physis is also called an apothesis, and it's where it's usually oblique to, long to the long axis of the bone. It provides appositional growth. It's usually at the origin or insertion of muscle tendons. It's extraarticular and it does not bear weight. Today, we're gonna to talk mostly about pressure physis and injuries to those. So important to review is the anatomy of the epiphyseal plate because this is really what helps us determine whether or not there's gonna be any long-term consequences. So if we know the areas of the epiphyseal plate and we know what's injured, it's gonna help us determine whether there's gonna be um, growth or rest or not. So the resting zone is the germinal matrix and basically those are inactive, but if that area is injured, that's a big problem. Lifative zone is the active chondrocytes and they produce mostly extracellular matrix. The hypertrophic zone is a larger, it's more organized chondrocytes, but they don't produce as much extracellular matrix. Within that hypertrophic zone, we'll go into later, there are three subzones. And then there's your zone of calcification. So that's where the cartilage becomes calcified and remodeled in the bone. So you've got your germinal matrix, and then as it progresses, it becomes into bone. When we talk about physal fractures, most happen within the hypertrophic zone, within the zone of provisional calcification. This is a transitional point between your calcified and your non-calcified bone, um, and your non-calcified uh, extracellular matrix. It's weaker than your nearby osseous ligamentous structures. So everyone always talks about like, oh, the physis is weaker than the ligaments. Because we're talking about this, this is like what I described to patients as baby bone. So this is like your baby. If you dropped your baby, it's gonna hurt a lot more than if you drop an adult, right? It's much weaker. It has also an increased risk with, uh, of growth disturbance when there's more zones involved. So if you have your baby bone plus your, you know, not even baby bone, your embryonic bone involved, you're gonna have a lot more difficulty with growth than if it's just that last zone. So knowing what zones are involved is important as we go forward. So the physis is designed to resist stress, but mostly in the traction or the pressure aspect. So more axial loading or axial pulling. It is not so good with rotational or torsional forces. We also have different shapes of our physis. So the flat physis, such as in the distal radius or the distal fibula, they generally only have injury that occurs in the hypertrophic zone. It doesn't get down to that germinal matrix and it's generally a very low risk. They do very well. But when you have an undulating or curved physis, like in the distal femur or the distal tibia, excuse me, or the uh, proximal tibia, you're gonna injure multiple zones. You're gonna include that germinal matrix and that has a much higher risk of growth arrest. Also during growth spurts, you really have a lot more of the cells multiplying and you have a larger range of those sort of baby cells. And so you have more risk of injury. Other thing that's really important in determining injury is what blood supply is ruined. So we have three blood supplies to the growth plate. One is through the periosteum, one is through the bone coming up through the middle, and then there's an epiphyseal. And that epiphyseal artery can be extra, um, extra physal, meaning like beyond it, or it can cross over. And depending on where it's located can really affect how much injury has occurred. So when you think about the femur, similar to other injuries to the femur, basically the, the blood supply to the femur crosses the neck. So if you have a physal injury, you're gonna have an injury to the blood supply and you're gonna have a higher risk of AVN or avascular necrosis. And so you're gonna have a much higher risk of, of long-term complications. Whereas in the distal radius or the, like the distal fibula there, they're not crossing the physis. You have an injury and it doesn't have an, as, as much of an effect. So some things that are important to think about about physal healing is that, remember, this is baby bone. This is repair of cartilage. It's not repair of bone. So there's no callus formation. You can take an x-ray two weeks, three weeks later, and you may not see any callus formation because it's mostly it occurs as an inflammatory phase and then a reparative phase. And it heals generally within three to four weeks. Because these kids, different than adults, their cells are turning over much more quickly, much more aggressively. 
And so physically, it, talk, it, it follows the, the hooter volkmann principle, which is compression slows growth, tension stimulates growth. So for example, in this Salter Harris II fracture, so it crosses the physis here and then goes out through the metaphysis. If you body tape these two fingers together, you're gonna to have compression on this side and, it, and um, extension or um, pulling on that side. And that's gonna encourage this fracture to straighten out. Um, and that is really the treatment you know, process. That's the thought process behind the treatment of the, this fracture here. You also have remodeling that happens. So remember, we don't have remodeling in the physis, but after the bone has healed, that physis is gonna go on to grow and that the remaining bone growth determines the ability to remodel. So while this is not a physial fracture here on the bottom right, it does show an example of remodeling. So if you had a physial fracture and then it heals, as it goes down the arm, because that's what happens as you add bone, you're going to follow Wolf's law where bone is gonna be added to the side that has more force and resorbed from the side that does not. So when kids are young, you can have more remodeling than when kids are older. So talking about the physical classification system, in 1963, Drs. Salter and Harris created the classification system for pressure epiphyses. So not the traction ones, not apophyses, but just the pressure epiphyses. And they based their classification on anatomy, fracture pattern, and prognosis. The thought process between classification systems is that they should be reproducible. They should be able to predict prognosis or fracture behavior. However, this classification system has not been validated for reliability, accuracy of predicting fracture behavior or for a predictor of fracture prognosis. But Many other people have come up with other classifications and this one seems to be predominantly favored. So when we look at this, you have um, type one through type five and we'll go through each one individually, but type one is thought to be the least likely to have long-term consequences with type five being the most likely to have consequences. However, the prognosis of growth plate fractures is really complex. It depends on the age of the patient and the amount of growth left. It depends on the preservation of blood supply, whether it's an open or closed fracture, the amount of displacement within the, um, the joint, how it's reduced, how well it's reduced, how long you uh, immobilize it, and then of course, which physis is involved. Most important probably is that joint displacement and the quality of reduction. So looking at the various types individually, Everyone has their own different mnemonics. I use this one from up to date. <clears throat> I didn't ever really use one on my own, but um, this is from up to date and it's the Salter, S-A-L-T-E-R. So S is for slipped. Um, this is where the fracture just extends to the zone of hypertrophy. It's mostly a cartilaginous. You can, you know, if you had ultrasound, you might be able to see the swelling of the periosteum, but on x-ray, it generally looks pretty normal. The exam might show swelling, tenderness, loss of range of motion. And it is um, about 6% of the physical injuries we see and generally occurs in younger children due to a longitudinal force applied to the physis. Um, I treat these with basically con um, being conservative. If someone's tender and it's over a growth plate, you need to immobilize them and protect them for a growth plate injury. I recheck them in two weeks and based on whether or not they still have pain, then I would treat them longer. If they don't have pain, obviously you want to return them to activity as soon as you can because immobilization has its own difficulties. But fractures take three to four weeks to heal. So if they are better in two weeks, it is not a fracture. In general, these do very well. We will show some examples where they don't, but in general, they do very well. Salto Harris II is above. So it goes through the physis and up into the metaphysis. So it crosses the zones of hypertrophy and inchondral ossification. So remember, when you go through your um, zone of hypertrophy, that's where the, the cells are turning over and creating new bone from cartilage. And then as it goes beyond that, it's into the, to the metaphysis, which has inchondral ossification or bone formation. It is your most common type of fracture, and it's about 75% of physical injuries. It's more frequent in young children, three to seven, but when you get to the older kids, it's the most common type. 
It's usually traumatic and has a little bit of a rotational component. And these kids still present with swelling, tenderness, and decreased range of motion. When you get an x-ray, you might see that corner sign or the Thurston Holland fragment, which you can see here, which is the little part that sticks up from the um, epiphysis. Generally, if they're non-displaced, we treat them with immobilization for about four weeks. If they're displaced, you can treat them with closed reduction under anesthesia. If they do not stay after they're reduced, then they need internal fixation. And then you do immobilize them for four weeks as well. Um, it's a very good prognosis, except for there are some bones that we'll talk about specifically later, such as the distal femur and tibia that don't do well. Salter Harris 3. So that's lower, so S-A-L, L for lower. And it basically goes through that hypertrophic zone of the physis, and then it goes through the proliferative zone and the germinal zone. So whenever you think of the uh, epiphysis, you've got to think of that the, the germinal zone or the resting sort of initiator of all growth is there. Also, you think it's in the joint, that's bad. So it often separates the growth plate and the fragment from the metaphysis and may fracture the articular cartilage. So you can't tell on x-ray if it's, if it's um, articular cartilage is fragmented. So oftentimes with these, you're going to get further imaging to determine the alignment and make sure that nothing is um, further displaced. These are about 8% of physal injuries. They tend to happen in older children when the physis is partially closed, but it can happen in younger ones as well. So treatment is Number one, reduction, reduction, reduction. You need to make sure that the articular surface is intact and you want to make sure that it stays intact. So if you're doing a closed reduction, you wanna follow this closely with x-rays. If you're doing an ORIF, you're gonna probably put a pin in to stabilize it. Um, so the most important thing for treatment is early anatomical reduction and fixation. Um, generally, this does pretty well because it tends to be in kids that are older and they're already close to closing. If it happens in a younger child, growth arrest is common. Salter Harris 4 is about 10% of physal injuries, and it goes through from the joint, through the growth plate, up into the metaphysis. So this crosses all of the different zones and has a higher risk of um, growth arrest due to crossing through all the zones. We see this in the elbow, and we see it in the tibia most commonly, distal tibia. Um, X-rays are often diagnose, diagnostic, but usually we get further imaging just to determine the alignment because we want to make sure that it's not separated um, to an extent that would affect the joint alignment. Usually these require surgery, and again, early anatomic reduction and fixation is really what's important for good prognosis. Similar to Salter Harris 3, these typically do well because they happen in older kids. But if they're done and if it happens in younger kids and they are not properly reduced, it does have a bad outcome. Salterus 5 is really, really rare, and we often don't see it because the x-rays could be normal, so the diagnosis is often delayed. Sometimes if you're questioning, you could get a comparison view and you might be able to tell. But the biggest problem is this usually crushes the terminal matrix, which basically eliminates any risk of uh, further growth from that joint, I mean, excuse me, from that physis. Um, so what happens is often we see it with growth delay and some will come in and they'll have a closed growth plate and or a significant bone bridge there that's causing changes. So initial treatment might be resection that surgical bone, uh, surgical resection of that bone bridge, but then later you might have to correct for alignment. Um, these are really rare, but the outcome is pretty poor. So what causes growth arrest? It's predominantly it's injury to that germinal matrix injury to the blood supply. Um, for example, I'm pointing here to the femur. We know that the blood supply crosses over the neck. And so if you cross, it crosses over the physis. So if you have a physial fracture, you're going to see breakage of that blood supply, and then you're going to have AVN. So despite the fact that they corrected this, treat, they treated this with an ORIF, it still had avascular necrosis because the blood supply was damaged. Also, if a bony bridge forms and it's not recognized, or even once it occurs, you, even if you remove it, you have to follow it, um, it can cause problems down the road with alignment. So thinking about factor, fact, factors that contribute to growth disturbance, 
we think typically a grade one or a Salter Harris one type of fracture is less likely to cause growth disturbance than type five. Also, the location is really important. So we know that like the distal femur proximal tibia is more likely to have growth disturbance than your proximal humerus or your radius or your distal fibula. Higher energy fractures also are at higher risk. The amount of initial fracture displacement is really important. Delayed reduction. So people that go to the ER and need reduction and aren't reduced right away, they're gonna have more um, likely to have growth disturbance than those that are reduced right away. And then once you reduce them, you need to make sure they stay reduced and that your reduction is adequate. Of course, nothing does well if you just keep hammering it. Like if your head hurts and you keep hammering it, your headache's not gonna get better. So forceful or repeated closed reductions do not work well. They cause growth disturbance. The other thing is how much growth is left. So all of these kids are young, right? But how much growth is left? So you wanna look at their bone age. I don't do bone age on a lot of kids, but if it's a really tricky fracture and you really wanna to need to know how much growth is left, you wanna determine that by a hand x-ray and looking at their bone age. You're not just looking at their chronological age. Of course, you can ask, you know, when did they get their first menses if it's a girl? You can look at um, Tanner stages for guys, but the most accurate is a hand x-ray. Um, when you have, um, when you have angulation, sorry, when you have angulation, age helps because it allows remodeling. Because remember Wolf's principle, it adds on to the part where there's stress and it takes away to the part where there's not. But if it's your physis, it doesn't remodel. So age doesn't help because it, then you get this bone bridge or growth arrest and it causes angulation um, because of the growth arrest. So we really want to monitor high risk fractures for angulation and shortening uh, to make sure that you catch it early enough and you can do um, appropriate treatment to prevent long term consequences. So we're going to go into some specifics here. Uh, first of all, we're going to talk about ankles. So ankle trauma is the most common pediatric orthopedic injury. It's difficult when you look at x rays at young kids to know whether or not that it is an appropriate ossification or is it, you know, is it a fracture or what is going on? And you need to know when things appear. So the distal tibia ossification appears around six months. The distal fibula is around one to three years, but it varies. So if you're unsure, just get the other extra, get an x-ray of the other side and it'll help you. And then growth plates tend to close in females around 12 to 17. So that's a broad thing. Again, it's based on when they start their periods. And usually within two to three years after starting their period, it's going to close. And then boys, 15 to 20. A little less obvious because you can't really, well, you can, but you're not really going to ask about when they developed pubertal hair or pubertal growth. Um, but you, there is, you know, following the Tanner stages, you can tell when they're going to close. But again, the best is just to kind of guess based on their age and looking at them. Um, so that distal tibial physis contributes about 40% of tibial growth and 17% of lower extremity growth. So it's a lot. And it starts at the beginning of growth. It's pretty equal, but as they get into adolescence, the distal tibia slows down and starts to close and it closes posterior medially to centrally and to anterior laterally. You don't need to remember that except for that it does cause certain fracture patterns that we'll talk about. The distal fibula fits in that lateral tibial groove. It's really strong ligamentous support. And so it tends to be harder to injure. So I liked this study and I actually listened to a podcast recently of the person who ran the study and it was interesting listening to them talk about it. So, you know, a lot of kids will come in and have these injuries to their ankle and not have anything on their x-ray. And we are typically taught that physis are weaker than the surrounding ligaments. So you can't have an ankle sprain, but can they have an ankle sprain? Well, there was a systematic review done in 2021 that looked at the different modalities used for diagnosis. It was determined that um, if you just did x-ray follow-up at three weeks, about 18% showed some Salter-Harris one 
um, callus formation, 26% showed avulsions. Of course, you can't see any um, ankle sprain because you can't see it on an x-ray. Ultrasound done at diagnosis with the hematoma suggesting a Salter Harris 1 fracture was about 57.5%. An MRI done showed 0 to 3% Salter Harris 1 fractures, up to 28% osteochondral avulsion of that distal fibula, 76 to 80% injury to the ATFL. So that suggests that most of these injuries are actually ligamentous. Then again, another study was done with 391 ankle injuries presenting to the ER. 31 were suspected of a Salter Harris 1 fracture. MRIs were done on all 31, and zero showed any Salter Harris 1 injury. So this just shows us that maybe every physis is a little bit different. And due to the distal fibular ligamentous support on that um, tibia, that maybe it is more likely to have a ligamentous injury. So to me, that tells me it's really important to treat the patient, not the image. So if you are worried about a bone or soft tissue injury, you need to protect. So they're tender at their distal fibula. They, they had an injury. They can't walk. They're swollen. They have loss of motion. Treat them with a boot. Put them in a cast. Do something. Recheck them in two weeks. If you're still questioning something's going on, sure, repeat the x-ray. But most of the time, you're either going to be tender there and you're gonna continue treatment with immobilization and maybe starting some range of motion and um, encouraging them to ice and, and continue treatment. Or if there's no tenderness, you might want to um, treat them based on their symptoms. However, if somebody sends you a patient with a distal fibular fracture and you look at it and it's at the end of the fibula and it kind of looks like it's old, like an avulsion fracture, most commonly, it's going to be a secondary ossification center that has not enclosed to the um, rest of the secondary ossification center. So it's not uncommon for kids to have a little separation, and it may never join, but most commonly, it, it just stays like that, um, and then it eventually joins. So you need to treat. If it's non-tender, don't treat them for a fracture. If they're walking in full range of motion and full strength, it is a secondary ossification center and be okay with that. When we talk about distal tibia, we think generally Salter Harris 1 and Salter Harris 2 fractures are not very high risk for growth disturbance. However, with the distal tibia, it actually has a large risk of growth disturbance due to the mechanism of injury that happens, the amount of displacement, and the difficulty with reduction. So if it's not reduced well, they do have a significant growth disturbance risk. So if it's displaced more than two millimeters, or you're not sure exactly how much it's displaced, it's really important to get a CT to measure it because typically those need surgical reduction and fixation. If it's, you know, looks perfectly aligned or very slightly malaligned, then close, uh, close reduction or just casting and immobilization for about four weeks. Generally, these kids take about six weeks to get out of a, um, a, a boot. You know, you might cast them initially, non-weight bearing, and then put them in boot. And it usually takes about six weeks before they're back walking and doing things. So this patient was referred to me, an eight-year-old gymnast with lateral, um, excuse me, with ankle pain was the description. The diagnosis given was a medial ankle fracture, medial malleolar fracture. She presented in 2022, and then and she had no tenderness to the medial or lateral malleolus. She did have some calcaneal tenderness and no injury. So when you hear eight-year-old gymnasts with pain in the ankle, the first thing you should think about is probably Seaver's disease or calcaneal apophysitis because she's pounding, jumping, whatnot, which is what she had. However, because of the x-ray, the ER diagnosed her with a, a fracture. She came in with a splint because of this finding on her x-ray, and she had no tenderness there. So I happened to see her for something else a little bit later. And this was the x-ray that, sh that showed. You can see this is about six months later and that ossification center is really filling in. She did not have a fracture there. She did have injury or, or pain in her growth plate. When we see adolescents, again, we talked about that, that eccentric closing of that distal tibial um, growth plate. 
So a common type of fracture we'll see in adolescence is a transitional fracture, a triplane fracture, which is like a Solteros 4, combo 2 or 3. And we see these about 5 to 10% of intraarticular fractures. It's usually about 18 months with enclosure, more common in boys and girls. It's triplane because it's three, frontal, sagittal, and transverse plane, transverse plane. Um, because of the closeness to their closing and their growth plates, the complication of growth is very rare. But it is really important to make sure that the cartilage is adequately reduced. So for example, on this, we might get a CT scan and see that there's a fracture through the articular cartilage and there's a one or two millimeter difference. That would mean that we would want to treat that surgically versus if there's no difference, you can treat that non-operatively. So this is an example of looking at the fracture. On x-ray, it looks pretty, I mean, it looks really good. Like it doesn't look like it's displaced at all, but when you get a CT scan, you can see that 3.3 millimeters displaced and really should be reduced. Another type of transitional fracture is a Tello fracture. And that's kind of like a four plane. It's a Salter Harris three. It um, occurs in three to 5% of pediatric ankle fractures. And the difficulty, again, is that it goes into the um, joint. So there's no current coronal plane as there is in a triplane, but basically we see this when this little chunk gets pulled away. Um, and it's usually a supination, external rotation injury. And again, we just want to make sure that the articular surface is intact. Again, due to the fact that it's in the last year growth usually, they don't have very many long-term consequences because they're almost done, but the consequences come from if the articular surface is not intact. So again, looking at this one, this one is minimally displaced on x-ray. You get a CT scan, you see minimally displaced. Um, and so this was a patient of mine that has had lots of fractures, but due to his um, really poor compliance, truly, uh, we ended up pinning it, and you can see he did very well. It healed well, and no issues with that. So here's a question number one. 11 year old boy sustained an ankle injury while playing football. AP radiograph obtained the day of injury is below. So what type of salt to hairs fracture is this? We're going to ask some questions later that you could actually put in the answer, but um, for this, we're just I'm going to move forward. Um, so it cross, it goes from the joint, it crosses the physis, and it goes out through the metaphysis. So this is a Salter Harris 4. And <laughs> treatment should consist of what? Closed manipulation, long leg cast. Well, that would work, but they'd probably have some joint issues. Um, closed manipulation and, and some knee issues. Short leg walking cast? No, because um, again, the articular surface is not intact. So basically the question is, is this an open reduction with internal fixation with a transficial, i.e. crossing the physis, or is it an open reduction with internal fixation that's parallel to the physis? The key here to this question is, besides knowing what type of fracture it is, you never want to cross the physis. Anytime there's a question about how to treat it, Unless it is almost closed, you never want to cross the physis. So the answer is parallel fixation. Shifting gears from the ankle to the distal radius and ulna. Um, so these are the most common type of fractures we see in kids, 25% of all fractures. Most occur in older children because what happens is their body mass increases and then they fall, but they're, they're still having growth spurts and so their growth plates are still wide open. And that distal facies of the radius contributes to 75% of the forearm growth, which is good because it allows a lot of remodeling, but it also is present for a long time. Um, so when you think of risk uh, of growth disturbance, really mostly the radius has, although it gives a lot of forearm growth, it really doesn't have much problem because it's such a flat facies. The ulna, however, if it is broken, it really has a large effect on growth disturbance. If your ulna gets a change in length of more than a centimeter, that typically causes a lot of um, issues, both with function and in pain. So also when we think of growth disturbance, the younger the age, 
whether the illness involved, whether there's multiple trauma involved, and also the reduction and stabilization of the fracture. So ulnar variance is something we talk about. And when you look at every x-ray, whether it's a kid or adult, you really typically want to see a little bit of what we call um, an ulnar negative variance. So that means the ulna is a little shorter than the radius because the radius is supposed to, um, to articulate with the scaphoid and the lunate. And if you have a prominence of your ulna, you're gonna have pressure points that are on your lunate that can cause avascular necrosis and changes in there. So this is something that typically we see, some people are congenitally have a long ulna, but mostly we'll see it if someone has a fracture or growth arrest of the radius, or you might see in a gymnast who has repetitive compression of their growth plate and it stunts that radial growth. So when we look at fractures, we wanna look and say, all right, so for example, in this top right, this radius and ulna are about the same. That right there on the AP tells me it's probably fractured. And you come over to the lateral and you can see, wow, yeah, that growth plate is fully pulled off dorsally. Again, um, and this is a Salter-Harris II fracture. Coming over here, again, you see a Salter-Harris II fracture. You see it through the growth plate and out into the metaphysis. That little fragment there is called a corner sign or a Thurston Holland fragment. When you reduce these, it typically pulls them right, that, that fragment right back with it. You can see non-displaced ones like in the bottom right where it comes across the physis and down into the metaphysis. It's pretty subtle. And actually on the x-ray, all you see is that little fragment, that line down the metaphysis. Yes, there is some widening on the lateral, but that may not be as obvious if you didn't have the um, corner sign that you see on the AP. The close reduction in these cases is important and the rules for close reduction include, number one, it's a physial reduction. So you wanna be gentle, you wanna do it within the first seven, five to seven days, the earlier the better. And you just wanna do it once, maybe twice, but you don't keep repeating it. Again, I said this before, if you had up a headache and you're hitting your head with a hammer, it's not gonna make your headache better. Repeated reductions do not help the problem. If you can't get it, you send them to surgery. They reduce it under anesthesia and pin it or use something to help them reduce it. But generally with physical injuries, you reduce it with gentle, steady pressure. The amount of angulation or displacement that is allowed depends on your age. So any sort of displacement of a physis is bad. If you can get it kind of close, that's great. But typically, um, and I, I put in some rules here for closed reduction, the distal radius and ulna, this really applies to extra physial fractures. So if you have 20 degrees of dorsal angulation, you're over 10 years old, that's okay. But when you're less than 10 years old, you can have a lot of angulation. You can also have the bone sitting side by side because the closer it is to the growth plate, the younger the age or the amount of growth remaining allows for more remodeling. Most remodeling occurs within the plane of motion of the joint. So here's an example of that fracture we saw above, pre and post reduction. So here we see it, here it looks like it's a little bit short, but it's still longer than there. But when we look over here, you can see it's tilted. So obviously displaced and then post reduction, this looks pretty good. So this person was reduced, they're put in a cast. And as you can see, it's probably a sugar tongue splint. They show up in your office from the ER. You don't take that splint off. You leave it on, you check their uh, fingers for swelling and pain control, check um, an x-ray at one week and at two weeks. And generally, if it's a couple of days after being in the ER and the swelling is probably stabilized, then I will overwrap that sugar tongue splint to make it a long arm cast. It's big and bulky, but it's stable and the kids feel great in it. And they can stay in that for the first two weeks. If you want to change them over at that point to a long short arm cast, you can, or you can leave them in that um, long arm cast for three weeks and then change them over to a, a removable brace or a neck brace. Salter three and four distal radius fractures are sort of a different ball game. These are ones that are most likely surgically reduced. Um, you wanna make sure that the articular surface is intact and that they are stable. 
So generally, these are referred for further imaging and um, surgical consultation. Switching to the fingers, probably the most common fracture that I see. Um, 27 in 1,000 patients is the incidence. Generally, they remodel better in the plane of motion. And if there's any sort of sagittal deformity, especially it's usually ulnar, you need to reduce it. So um, this bottom right picture is actually a picture of a hand, but, um, and I actually showed it earlier. Clinically, this there was no ulnar deviation, but if this was a finger and you saw a significant ulnar deviation, and we'll talk about it as we, as we move forward, um, looking at their fingers straight out, looking to make sure that there's no um, angulation there, bending their MCPs to 90 degrees. Is there any you know, rotation or angulation there? And then curling their fingers, you wanna make sure that they are intact there. When we go through here across the board, I'm showing you a Salter Harris one, which we're gonna talk about in more detail. Salter Harris two, which is similar to this one, three, which is into the joint. And then this one, you always have to look for that little fourth. These are both surgical consultations because again, you've got to think about that joint. When you look at fingers, you have to remember that typically in one through four of the metatarsals and metacarpals, the physis are distal. In the first one, they are proximal. Sometimes though, you'll see a pseudoepiphysis in the distal aspect um, or in the proximal aspect of the second meta purple. So, and here you can actually see a little bit of one in the distal first. So recognizing where it's supposed to be and then recognizing that this is what's called a pseudoepiphysis and not a fracture. So when we're talking about finger injuries, it's really important to look for rotational deficit. So I always, as I said earlier, look at them with their fingers straight out, bent to 90 degrees, and then curl down and they should all face in towards their scaphoid. If you see any crisscrossing, that needs to be reduced. And if it's rotational, that is usually a surgical reduction. If it is angular, like the bottom x-ray shows on the left, that can be reduced in the office. Depending on the age of the kid and the tolerance of the kid, you may be able to do it without any sort of um, anesthesia. Otherwise, you'll need to do a uh, hematoma block or a finger block. The one that I use most commonly is the pencil or a pen as a fulcrum. So you put the pencil or pen in between the fourth and fifth digit or whichever digit you're reducing, and then you bend it down a little and push it in. The problem with this is that it's really painful. They already hurt to push there, and then you put that pen there and it really makes it worse. Um, another technique is the 90-90. So you flex at the uh, MCP and you flex at the PIP and then you apply some pressure on the, uh, some volar directed pressure on the metacarpal, and then you do, you kind of push down on the proximal phalanx in a dorsal angulation, and that tends to work really better, and it, it, it tends to be more tolerated. A significant uh, fracture to recognize is a Salter Harris II, typically, of the uh, distal phalanx. It's more common in the toe, but you see it in the finger too. You might see a hematoma at the, well, you usually will see a hematoma at the nail base. And what you have to worry about is an injury to the nail bed. This is considered an open fracture. So basically your nail has been displaced and it lacerated the nail bed. Um, and typically that, that nail has popped out of the nail bed. If that happens, you can irrigate it, give them antibiotics, um, stabilize everything. But if you um, are concerned that the, the nail is trapped, then that's a surgical irrigation. And then they repair that nail bed. You really want to make sure that that nail bed doesn't close because then they're going to lose their nail and they're going to have um, long-term consequences of you know, not having a nail there. When you can, you want to keep that nail fold open and you want to stabilize that nail within the nail bed or nail fold, excuse me. So a couple more common fractures that we're going to talk about and then we're almost done. Um, proximal humerus very forgiving. Um, it provides about 80% of the longitudinal growth of the upper arm and it remodels greatly. So the only time we really need to refer these are open fractures, if there's a neurovascular injury or it's really displaced and something that's older. Um, and then of course, if it goes into the joint. 
So typically these are really forgiving. So here's a question. Nine-year-old boy sustains injury to his right shoulder during a skateboarding fall. He complains of pain and deformity. There's no deficits on neurovascular exam. What's the most appropriate treatment? Well, this is a significantly displaced salter here is probably two fractures. It's a little fuzzy, but I think this is a fragment. Um, and you know, nine-year-old has a lot of growth left. So we're gonna probably treat this with the sling and look how well it immobilizes, sorry. Um, look how well it remodels. So his growth plate is still open. It's clearly come down to here and look at all this. This is Wolf's principle where it fills in where the stress is. It doesn't fill in when the stress is not. So this is a mobilization, sling, follow-up radiographs. Distal humerus is a different story. This is really rare. But if you see a kid less than three years old with their elbow dislocation, you have to think non-accidental trauma or physial fracture. This is not something that you want to miss because it has a significant long-term consequence. Generally, you're gonna have, if you get an elbow x-ray, you might see it. If you get a skeletal exam, you're not gonna see it. But the only thing you might see is, is that um, elbow dislocation or, or displacement, posterior fat pad. A lot of times you just really have to have significant um, uh, suspicion for it because typically little kids should not have significant elbow injuries. And if they do, worry about their physis. Proximal femur. So in terms of stress or Salter Harris fractures, really not very common. You're not gonna have a traumatic physial injury, but very common or not very common, but much more common is a gradual injury to that physis. So this will definitely be on boards, um, slipped capital femoral epiphysis. It's a gradual slip is, slippage of your metaphysis relative to your epiphysis. Usually there's like this antecedent epiphysolysis or like irritation of the growth plate. Most commonly it occurs in obese males during rapid growth. It's usually, or can be bilateral, but the number one risk factor is obesity. If the kid is less than 10 years old and their BMI is less than 50%, you need to look for other causes. This is like probably the most important thing you can take away from the Skiffy recommendation is less than 10, BMI less than 50%, it's probably some other cause, endocrine or something else. Treatment is surgical reduction and pinning. If they're less than 10 and their BMI is less than 50%, think something else and do bilateral pinning. Otherwise, if it's obese male, typically you can get away with one and then they follow, one hip being treated and then follow. So question, 13 year old boy complains a three month history of left knee, thigh and groin pain. His pain is significantly worsened over the last um, week. He denies pain in right leg. Radiographs are shown as below. History and physical do not reveal any findings concerning for endocrine disorder. What is the diagnosis? So you can see here that the uh, femoral head is slipped off of the metaphysis. So this is a skiffy, slip tactile femoral epiphysis. The preferred treatment is insight um, to single screw insertion across the proximal femoral physis. And given the fact that this kid was 13 years old to so over 10, and it doesn't talk about his weight, but no endocrine disorder, we're going to do a single leg. If it's less than 10 in girls, less than 12 in boys, concern of endocrinopathy, or as you look, you can't really see it on here, but right around here is the triridate cartilage. If that's open, that typically tells you that they're immature and that would tell you to do bilateral treatment. Another area we worry about is the distal femur, not a common area for physio fractures, but when you get an MCL injury in a kid with an open physis, you need to think about this, especially if you see an x-ray that shows any displacement or widening of that growth plate, worry about that periosteum getting trapped inside of there. Could be a Salter Harris 1 with periosteum trapped or could be a Salter Harris 2, but those have really high complication rates. So be aware and don't be afraid to get further imaging um, just to confirm your diagnosis. Proximal tibia is also another area that's rare but has very high risk of growth arrest due to the fact that it's usually high energy trauma 
and it has a high risk of vascular injury and compartment syndrome because of the vascular injury. If it's more than two millimeters displaced, you need to have imaging and surgical consultation. So we're gonna to come to our, our three CAQ questions. One is which clinical sign is most sensitive for the diagnosis of compartment syndrome in a child? So please answer, um, and as soon as you answer, we'll get a sense of whether it's pulselessness, pallor, paresthesia, paralysis, or increasing analgesia requirement. So go ahead and answer if you can. I don't know how many people are gonna answer, but I'm gonna just go ahead with the answer here. I like what people are, are saying. So in kids, it's really important to think about if a child is requ requesting increased pain medication, don't think they're being a wimp. Don't think like something else is going on. You've got to look and say what's obvious. Compartment syndrome, first thing that you check is, all right, why are they having increased pain? And typically in kids, this is what we'll see first. So second question, nine-year-old female presents to the ED after falling while climbing a tree. She has tearful and recoils with palpation of her distal radius. She has swelling over the distal radius. Exam is otherwise normal. Um, X-ray reveals a fracture along the physis into the metaphysis. What is the most appropriate treatment? So treatment with this, sorry, I reduced the question so I can't see how many people answered. Close reduction and immobilization with cast and splint. Good, most people got that. So the reality here is this should be able to be done closed. If you can't, of course, then you, 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 know, you go to a surgical, but you, you don't wanna send this out the door. 10 year old boy presents the ER with elbow pain after falling during soccer. He has a swollen elbow and limited motion. Which of the following would suggest an occult fracture? Anterior fat pad, posterior fat pad, anterior humeral line bisecting the capitellum, Bilaterally equal Bauman sign, Bauman's angle of 75 degrees. So this is a question that is super, super important. It will definitely, definitely be asked on your CAQ. So posterior fat pad is not normal. Anterior fat pad is can be normal. So on this left picture, you can see a little bit of an anterior fat pad. That can be normal. Posterior or that sail sign mm -hmm. is abnormal. Anterior humeral line should always bisect the capitellum. We do see it if you have a supracondylar fracture and this capitellum is posterior dislocated, it'll cross either in front of or in the anterior portion of it. And then Bauman's angle is when you draw a line across the condyles and compare it perpendicular to the line of the humerus, it should be about 70 to 75 degrees. Um, again, it should be the same bilaterally. So if you have bilateral views, it should be the same. So summary points is that physal fractures are common. If they're tender on the growth plate, you wanna protect. Most will heal well if you follow the principles of treatment and avoid iatrogenic growth disturbance. You wanna check alignment and displacement. If you're not sure, get further imaging. Follow up with um, post-reduction films and follow closely for recurrent displacement. Um, treat the patient, not the x-ray. Look and make sure it's a fracture and not just an ossification center. It's confusing in kids. They have ossification centers everywhere. Um, and then age and remaining growth matter. So if the younger the age, typically the, in some cases better, but in some cases worse, because you don't want angulation. Thank you. This is my, I, I actually used a lot of resources, but these are the most common. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. I realize we're right at an hour. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Lots of good information in there. And for everybody, for the CAQ, those were some good examples because the a lot of times they won't necessarily ask what the diagnosis is. So you just have to recognize it. And then they ask what the treatment is. So some good ones there. Um, are there any similar fractures to the TLO in other 
bones or is the tilo kind of unique in that aspect? It's pretty unique because of the way that that growth plate closes um, in terms of, and actually that's what's interesting about all the different growth plates is that they close at different times and they close differently. So for example, your fibula closes more um, symmetrically as well as like any other flat physes. So I can't think of one that's similar. Uh, that being said, actually, you can see it a little bit in elbow in the, the condyles and the epicondyles. You have a similar one, but it's not because of the way that it's closing. It's just that you typically have a similar type of fracture. And then I know you said before, kind of the rule is try not to cross the growth plate, but with the skiffy, I'm guessing that's kind of the way you have to treat it. There's so probably not a good option the other way. So the skiffy, the problem is that, well, any sort of fracture of the proximal humerus, um, excuse me, the proximal femur, is that that blood supply crosses that growth plate. So anywhere, and that's, that is a unique aspect. Also at the proximal tibia, you have a little bit of um, the, the blood supply is very close. And so where the periosteum encloses the blood supply is really what matters. So when you break your proximal femur, you are, almost indefinitely, if you cross the physis, whether it's a Salter Harris one or five, uh, well, or four, you're going to disrupt that blood supply. So that's why it's such a high risk. Um, anywhere that you disrupt the blood supply. So for example, if you go from, you know, even a Salter Harris two, where you go across the physis and then you come out, if it disrupts the blood supply, you're going to have a higher risk of growth arrest. So it really depends on the extent of where that crosses into the Thurston Hall and fragment. Thank you. We have a question from Evan Melville. For a Seymour fracture, how can we tell the difference between an open fracture and the subungual hematoma? Or do you just need to ensure you have imaging every time? So, you, I mean, you wanna have imaging no matter what, but it's not, that's not always gonna show you. So that nail is gonna like pop up significantly. And when that pops up significantly, especially if you can see the proximal end of the nail, you know that it's out, right? And when you get the, because when you look at, and I think I can actually go back to the, um, to the slide, when you see the, and you know, I hate these fractures because, so this one right here, the nail looks like it's there. Everything looks um, good. Not really. Okay. We can't see your screen. Oh, why is that? Um, hmm. Can you uh, click share screen? Yeah, I'm on it. Uh, oh. I wonder why that is. I don't know why it went away. Sorry. Um, so it doesn't matter if it's there or not, but okay. So when, thank you, sorry. So when you look at this picture here, the nail is sort of intact. You see that there is um, a hematoma here, but it, it, it doesn't look swollen or, or elevated. When you come down here, you can see this nail is out. So that tells you that the nail is not in the nail bed. Again, here's the same thing. The nail is not in the nail bed. And so that, that last, that, tells you that it was torn. And so you can see that there's a line here that means it's an open fracture because basically it's open from the nail, base of the nail into there. So that's that's really your key to show you that it's open because that's that's the entry point is, is actually the nail um, that takes you in there. Does that answer your question? They said, yes. Okay. Great. <laughs> and then I was just curious if you had any kind of most interesting or memorable, difficult Salter Harris fracture cases. I know you don't <laughs> have imaging with you, but. No, actually, um, I was kind of joking with someone today because I told you about the kid that had the um, Tolo fracture of the ankle and we treated him, even though it wasn't minimally displaced, but he's like a difficult kid. I could not find his imaging because I guess it was from an outside hospital, but he had a um, 
proximal tibial physal fracture. And so this poor kid came in um, swollen knee. And, you know, when you think about valgus stress, MCL, ACL, all that, initially I was just sort of like, oh, okay. And his x-ray was kind of questionable, but not really, didn't, it didn't suggest that there was any sort of fracture, but he had an open growth plate in his proximal tibia. So I got an MRI and it showed that he had a tibial, a proximal tibial physial fracture. And the difficult thing with him was, you know, that I put into a T-scope. So it was, instead of a um, cast, I was trying to immobilize him, but give him the ability to still bathe and whatnot. And he wasn't very compliant but he, he did heal. And then he came back about six months later with a, that was his left leg. And then his right knee was a patella dislocation. And then he showed up about eight months later with that ankle fracture. So very memorable, my first proximal tibial uh, physial fracture that then went on to show me a couple other things too. So those proximal tibial fractures are not very common, but again, don't miss them because if somebody just doesn't, if they have a normal ACL exam, a normal MCL exam, but they're really tender, you've got to look and protect for that because that growth plate can have a lot of long-term consequences if it's not treated appropriately. That's an important one. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. I think that's it for questions. And usually everyone, we do have a link to evaluate the lecture, but um, that will be updated this time when the YouTube link is sent out. So thank you, everyone. Excellent. Thank you so much.